That's very fortunate. This is about Tommy Letton, a local character who was a fishmonger up until the age of 82. He loved the docks and the people. He loved every one of them. Tom, do you want a cup of tea? Tom, do you want this? They're so kind. It was just like going from home to home. It wasn't like going through to work. And he would pick up different languages. And eventually, he was quite good. And he was quite good at Arabic. He even had to go at Chinese. <laughs> he even had to go at that. Jeanette is turning Tommy's story into a cartoon, voiced by the comedian Mel Gedroich. You hear the call of the sea, you just have to go. I'll do that again. C is quite a hard word to say in Welsh. C, C. How would Richard, <laughs> how would Richard Burton say it? The big night is fast approaching and local musicians and singers are rehearsing Jeanette's song about the Yemeni dagger. Contemporary works of art are now ready to take their place in the museum's display cabinets. Although it is a contemporary painting, it's got some kind of very traditional aspects about it. Mm. I think it's really exciting. I just thought if I put a lot of black around the edges, it'd make quite a nice contrast with the middle, so it makes his face stand out a lot more, and then it gives different tones and textures of the boons, so it was really great fun. Hear the call of the sea, you just have to go. Oh, Tiger Bay, Tiger Bay, hot fish and chips on its way. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and the exhibition has just opened. And if you'd like to see Jeanette's animation about Tommy the Fish Vendor, you can catch it online from Monday at bbc.co.uk forward slash arts. Now I must admit to a bit of a TV crush, I love Andrew Graham Dixon. Nobody can talk about art like he can. That's why we dispatched him to the National Gallery in London for a very private view of a hidden masterpiece and to see if he could convince two A-level students that Rembrandt is the man. The National Gallery at night can be an eerie, unnerving place. The crowds have gone for the day, and yet you're still surrounded by faces. Old faces, young faces, petrifying faces. It's easy to believe you're not alone. But I'm glad to say, I'm not. Demi Daniel and Megan Poulton are A-level art students from Mossbourne Academy in Hackney. And we're here for a special audience with one of the greatest portrait painters who ever lived. Here we are. I want you to meet an old friend of mine. I think of him as a friend of mine anyway. Rembrandt himself. Rembrandt produced over 80 self-portraits, and each one encapsulates a different chapter in his extraordinary life. He's actually a youngish man when he painted this picture, wearing his very best clothes. You notice, like, his hand sort of innocently leaning on a ledge. Mm. That's a kind of coded message, because there was a famous painting by an Italian artist called Titian of a famous poet, and poets were looked up to in the way that painters weren't looked up to yet, especially in Holland. Mm -hmm. And painting himself like that was Rembrandt's way of telling everybody, I'm a painter, and painters, by the way, are every bit as important as poets. Look up to us, look up to me. What do you think of the look in his eyes? It's like he's asked you a question and he's expecting an answer. But he's got a sort of eyebrow raise. Yeah. And what do you think the emotion is? Well, I think it's almost like he's posing, sort of putting up a, a facade, like a front. But when I look into his eyes, I almost see pain and sort of sadness, like something's going on with him, but he's trying to hide it, perhaps. Uh, that's what I see as well. When you actually look in his eyes, maybe everything isn't quite right. There's an explanation for Rembrandt's sadness in a nearby painting of his wife, dressed up as Flora, the goddess of flowers, fertility and spring. 
Saskia. He's painted her in the persona of Flora. And I think the painting is a kind of lucky charm for their marriage. And the hope being that she will bear many children just as spring brings forth many flowers. It's, it's almost like a hymn to her fertility. It seems to be glowing with you know, hope of children and love and happiness. And yet it's a very sad painting because not only would a lot of those children have died young, but she died young too, within just a few years of the picture being painted. After Saskia's death, Rembrandt was devastated, but within 10 years, he'd put himself back together again. And towards the end of his life, he produced some of his most passionate portraits. These faces, powerful and moving, still speak to us across the centuries. By the time Rembrandt painted this picture, you know, he's 63 years old, he's not got very long to go in his life. And it's really gone rather badly wrong for him. He's been financially ruined, he's bankrupt, he's lost his house. It's really quite bleak for him. What do you think of this face? He's a very honest artist. I think he puts yeah. a lot of his emotions and his life into his painting. Yeah. You really feel that you're in the presence of somebody's feelings. Yeah. It's like yeah. a piece of emotion just hanging there on the wall. It's not, it's not just an image. Rembrandt ended his life alone and impoverished, and yet many of his portraits express all of the wealth and power of 17th century Amsterdam. And tonight, we're in for a real treat. We're being allowed behind the scenes of the gallery for a private view of a portrait that hasn't been seen by the public for over six years. Thousands of hours have gone into restoring its original glory, and as ever with Rembrandt, things are not always as they seem. And here it is, the portrait of Frederick Riehel. Larry, you've been working on a huge Rembrandt. Yeah, it's a very exciting picture. I mean, it's a very impressive thing anyway, because it's unusual for him to do a big equestrian portrait. The really exciting thing we learned a few years ago was that there was another painting underneath it, a completely different one. You've got this, I've, this is one you prepared earlier. Yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> so, you know, Come we, and have a look, girls. This, this, is, this is the extra, you know, that's like what's underneath the surface of the painting that we can see. It's very much like a medical x-ray. And in this case, you can see the shape of the sitter. But if you turn the thing 90 degrees, you can see there's another figure standing. So this canvas has been reused. To me, they look like the same figure. We can't be absolutely sure about that, but it's certainly true it's the same kind of big face. If, if it is the same person, it seems like the, the original one is quite modest, like he's by a fence and mm -hmm. by his home. It makes me wonder whether he looked at, looked at the fur, came and visited Rembrandt in his <laughs> studio and saw this rather more modest version of him as a country squire and said, no, no, I want something yeah. grander than that. <laughs> Turn and Rembrandt thought, oh, I better do what he says. I think one of the wonderful things about seeing a painting in this situation, almost you know, on the operating table, is you, you really get the sense of what, what it's about. And I think what Rembrandt's about is this tremendous boldness what do you think when you look up at that face? Like, really confident in a calm way. Like, I know I'm the man. Yeah, powerful. <laughs> He's the man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Well, it's, I've really enjoyed going around with you, and I'm really glad that you like my friend. <laughs> <laughs> and there'll be a major Rembrandt exhibition at the National Gallery in the autumn. Blockbuster is a word we've associated with action movies and superheroes, but now it's regularly used to describe old master exhibitions. They're certainly much needed to generate cash, but at what cost? Now, back to my wise panel. Bethany, it was all profit for you, wasn't it? You were formed by a blockbuster. I have to say I am very biased because a blockbuster gave me my life as I know it. Um, I was four or five and somebody took me to the Tut and Kamun exhibition at the British Museum in 1972. We queued for hours, it was very boring. But then I remember that moment of epiphany when I walked in and there was this boy king covered in gold and I just thought 
all the fairy tales I've ever heard, they are true and they are there incarnate in front of me. And I didn't go to any museums for the rest of my childhood, but that single moment made me want to be a historian. But the modern blockbuster Jude has a problem. You know, it's quite expensive to get into. You can be paying up to 16 quid a ticket. You find you go in and you can't see really any paintings. You can just see the back of people's heads. That museums and galleries seem to stuff people in because they really need the money and the experience is awful. Well, the quality of the experience can be dreadful. Mm. It can be fantastic. I mean, obviously museums are worried about the problem and thinking how to deal with it. But I think as Bethany says, one thing that happens is that people share a huge story and people talk about a story they've all seen together. So in some respects, the blockbuster takes over from the Saturday night show. You know, if enough people have seen it, they can discuss it. Well, but, you know, there are other kinds of blockbusters that I'm interested in, which is, you know, for example, we do this thing called Women of the World Festival, or a festival of deaths that we did, which was massively successful. Thousands and thousands of people came, but they came for lots and lots of different experiences. And, was it, and they collected did they pay for it or was it free? 50% free. 50% of because the people pay when for. I was at Tate, one of the most extraordinary <laughs> things was we would put on a big Turner exhibition, a big spectacle, and people would queue around the block. And literally, on the other side of the gallery was one of the most remarkable collections of Turner in the world, Tumbleweed. Yeah, Is there I'm such sorry, a... Sorry, Amy, sorry. No, no, no you, just, can... you just butt in. <laughs> I will, I will, only just to say that we are trying to do something about this crowding thing. Yeah. That we've done these things called Vikings Live and Pompeii Live from the British Museum, where we actually take the exhibition to cinemas, so 400 cinemas around the country. You still pay 15 quid, so it's still not free, but it's like a private view and you can see the object. So we are trying, I'm saying. I don't saying. think everything should be free anyway. I mean, free is a really important thing for people to have tastes who can't afford it. But, you know, we have got money, those of us who are working, and we should be prepared to pay for coffee. I mean, yeah. one, one area which is almost always free is online, of course. Is there such a thing as a cultural blockbuster online? Well, I mean, the closest thing I guess you get to a blockbuster online is a viral video of a cat doing something funny or, you know, a child doing something funny. So I think the main issue, I think, yes, there are blockbusters online. But are there true cultural blockbusters online? I think we are in the early days of what's possible about extending the life of a blockbuster from the physical to the digital. And I think that's really the exciting stuff that's going to come in the next few years. But one of the problems is the reverse of that, isn't it? Because people go into these blockbusters, as we know, and one of the reasons it's so stuck is because they're looking down yeah. at their device, not at the painting, or they've got an audio thing in. And actually technology, in a way, is slowing the whole thing down and stopping people looking at the art. Well, I think it's not slowing the whole thing down. I think currently people are trying to figure out what's the right way to engage people in a physical environment using digital technology. And I think no one's really figured out the perfect route to that. And I think that's just because, as I said, it's early days. It's going to take a little bit of innovation. It's going to take a little bit of experimenting. Some are going to get it right. Some are going to get it wrong. And the ones who get it right are going to go on to make more blockbusters. Well, what do you mean about this? Google what Glasses recently. Google Glasses, we're improving. You know, we're an extraordinary thing of being able to see the object and be yeah. explain, have explained at the so, same time. So, so, Bethany, do you see technology just at the beginning of what it can do for museums? Obviously, it's, it's been in museums for, for decades, actually. But do you think we're just at the foothills of what can be achieved? Uh, and absolutely no doubt. And what we've got to do is collaborate so that museums and Google, that we talk together, so we work out the very best way. But museums are never going to go. I mean, we've been collecting objects for the last 50,000 years yeah. and putting them all around us in our homes, in our, in our sanctuaries, in our settlements. Yeah. And we're always going to want to have that live experience with a real thing. So, so I think, you know, they're, they're, we're going to move forward. We're going to have museums and excellent and technology. I do not think you can live without the live experience. I want to make that very clear clear because a lot of people think that you know the online is just going to you know make people stop coming to museums but the art newspapers results this year or last year show one of the highest growth in museum attendance while stuff is happening online what do you mean that transition from the physical to the, the digital then well i think the transition in the sense that okay you're sitting at home you don't have time to go to a museum you don't have access to the collection but can you still get a taste of culture online and i think the problem is cultural content online is not a part of our daily habit we don't go to a website every morning like we would to The Guardian or to a news website. We don't go to the Tate's website and check for an artwork right now, but maybe we will On in the future. Life, yeah. And that's the exciting part, when it seamlessly incorporates into your daily life. Wise, wor like wise words, Jude, I'm afraid we're going to have to stop it there. Wise words from our wise panel. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Now, we know that millions of us visit museums and galleries every year. We also know that millions of us don't. So if people don't or can't come to museums, should we take museums to them? Well, that's exactly what the celebrated photographer Rankin has done.
for museums at night, he turned an allotment site into an art gallery. And against the clock, They're brilliant, these are, I think. That's wonderful. Very flattering, that is. It's got a lippy on, I notice. Ranking subjects have been drawn from the world of pop, politics and fashion.